All right. All right. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another special edition of the Frankie Slauson Show uh, video series or interview series or whatever you want to call it. Uh, today I have a very special guest of a, of a guest that was so legendary. Uh, it, it's just a tragic uh, tragedy that he is no longer with to a drunk driver, but uh, th he's a uh, brother to great Sam Kinnison. And I believe he's also Sam, he was Sam's uh, manager or role manager, uh, if that's correct, uh, Mr. Bill Kinnison. How's it going? Hey, doing good, Sean. How you doing, man? I'm I'm doing all right. You know, I'm I'm uh, very honored to to have this chance to uh, to speak with you uh, because of uh, just the fact that you were nice enough to let me do this. Well, no problem. No problem at all. I've always been a I've always been a big fan of your brother, as well as many other great comedians like the late great George Carlin and Richard Pryor and Steve Martin and stuff like that. But there was something about Sam that just uh, every time I every time I either hear his name or watch a DVD or listen to a CD or, or see something on the internet, it always makes uh, puts a smile on my face because of just the way Sam was with his comedy. Well, his, his comedy was timeless. Uh, you could uh, you can play it today, even though he'll be he'll be dead uh, 21 years uh, on April the 10th. You can still you can still play it today, and it's relevant. So it was just timeless comedy. By the way, you mentioned Richard Pryor. A good piece of trivia is that uh, Richard Pryor and Sam Kinison both came out of the projects in Peoria, Illinois. Oh wow! Yeah. I did yep. I did not realize that. Uh well, I knew that yeah, yeah, he was from Illinois, uh, or Sam was, but I, I didn't uh, realize that Richard was. Yeah, yeah, actually, both of them came out of uh, Harrison Holmes there in Peoria, Illinois. So, I mean, that's kind of ironic, <laughs> even though we didn't know each other then. We met each other, uh, you know, later when, when uh, Sam was doing comedy, ended up being good friends. I'm still good friends with uh, his son, Richard Pryor Jr., to this day. But yeah, I always think that's kind of unique. The projects in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, you had two of the greatest stand-up comedians of all come out of them. It's kind of funny because he was like, uh, he was like the late great Martin, you know, he was from Gary, Indiana, and that's just a small little town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just outside Chicago, a little industrial town. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, you know, it's when you when you think about how far people have gone from coming from small towns or small little areas or just wherever they came from to be to become the, the legends that they uh, have tried to be or that they are to this day, you know. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, the, uh, you know, those that come out and, you know, pick a career that they're very successful in, almost like, uh, you know, it was predestined for that to happen for them. That doesn't mean they didn't go through struggles. I know that uh, Sam went through a lot of struggles before he even got into comedy. And uh, talking to Richard Pryor as much as I did, uh, you know, he went through many, many struggles. And so maybe that's just what forms that drive in them that they, uh, you know, they want to make it. They just don't want to go back to Peoria and Gary, Indiana. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, and it's just kind of, I guess it, it's just one of those things that we'll never, we'll never know about because, uh, you know, those are two legends that are no longer with us. But, but the thing about that that makes Sam so unique is, is the fact that when I listen to his comedy, you know, he he basically will talk about anything. He ain't a, he wasn't afraid to to share it all. Well, there was nothing uh, nothing was sacred to Sam. Uh, everything was fair game, including himself. I think what made him uh, very unique was for Sam was not a joke teller. He was a storyteller, uh -huh. and uh, and the stories that he told was either his life experiences or that was his really his views on whatever that subject would be. And so I think that made him very unique. He never ever wrote a routine. I don't know if he could have. Uh, literally, every show he got up, it was off the top of his head of whatever was going on and, and his commentary on it. And I think that made him, I think it separated him from everybody else. Yeah, and uh, the fact, you know, what makes it even more unique, uh, if most people don't know, I, I would hope that they would know about Sam, the fact that he was a, a preacher before he became a comedian, and you don't normally see that, even today. Well, that's, that's true. He preached for seven years, but we, uh, you know, we were raised in a preacher family, and myself and all three of my brothers uh, all ended up preaching because you're kind of raised with a psychology that, 
they never tell you that. I mean, our parents never ever sit down and went, this is what you're supposed to be. But, yeah. You know, you kind of raised with that psychology. You're in this family because you're supposed to be a preacher. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be happy, that's what you're going to end up doing. Well, uh, my dad died, and uh, Sam was named after him, and he felt like, you know, since he... He had his name. He had to do it for dear old dad. He always called it the John Lennon syndrome, you know. He had to do it for dear old dad. And uh, ironically, he wasn't that good or that successful. He was a good preacher, but he wasn't that successful. And his uh, weakness was uh, he really didn't have much stage presence in the ministry, but then you see him in comedy, and that's the strongest strongest element uh, that he had. So it was a matter of, uh, you know, Sam doing really what he wanted to do, and uh, being a preacher, doing what he thought everybody thought he should do. So, so, uh, but in your own personal opinion, though, uh, when you got to listen to Sam preach, did you think that he got the message out, or do you think that he made a pretty good preacher? Uh, Sam, uh, you know, Sam, we used to, my bro- older brother and I, Richard, uh, we were very, very, very successful in the ministry. We had big crusades. I pastored in 17 years. I pastored six churches. Uh, so we tried to mentor Sam, and uh, Sam thought preaching was was just about giving out information. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, and I would try to stress to him that you know it's giving out information in an entertaining way. You have to entertain these people. They're not going to sit, you know, and come every night to hear a lecture. And there, you know, people just weren't going to do that. And I think that was Sam's biggest flaw in the ministry. He was very. Uh, he had very sincere, very intense, but it really wasn't that entertaining huh. when it came to delivering what he wanted to do. So I considered him a, a good preacher, but if you, you know, style-wise and everything, no, he wasn't very good. Okay. See, I never, I, I, I don't think I ever had a chance to, to listen to him preach. I think on the, the DVD that I, I, one of the DVDs that I purchased, the uh, Why Did We Laugh DVD, the documentary that you were yeah. a part of, mm-hmm. I there was a bonus CD that it came with, uh, with uh, hearing him preach, but I don't think I even had a chance to listen to that. So I, I guess I've never. I, I think they they uh, had like little uh, ex, excerpts or whatever in the documentary, but uh, yeah, we did. I, I I thought it sounded pretty good though. I mean, from a personal standpoint, from what I heard in the documentary, anyway. Well, you got to remember, you were getting the best of. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in a documentary, you know? it's, it's like it's like a, a band, you know, and they do their first album. Well. You know, that's the best stuff for the 15 years they've been together, and then they got to knock out another album in six months, and they usually are called One Hit Wonders. <laughs> so now they got to come up with a whole new uh, thing. But, uh, I mean, you know, Sam, if you, uh, we have two CDs on his website. One is The Passion of Sam, and the other is The, the Last Sermon, which really was his last sermon in the ministry. And, uh, and both of those are very, very compelling. But it's different listening to somebody and actually sitting in an audience and watching them. Sure. I mean, you can hear hear a tape, you know, and uh, and probably benefit a lot of times more than watching the person. And Sam just did not have much stage presence. He'd stand behind a pulpit and, you know, wasn't very animated and everything. And and uh, I know that it's really shocking, but that's that was the way it was. Actually, if Sam would have had his way, he probably would have stayed in the ministry, but... Uh, he and his wife had caught his wife in an affair, and uh, they got a divorce. And in our circles, that was the worst thing that could happen to you. Man, you could be, you could be homosexual, you could be a thief, you could be a child molester, yeah. you could be anything. They forgive you, but if you got a divorce, uh, you know they'd always pull out the scripture: "Man that can't take care of his own house is not fit for the house of God." So, oh, jeez. <laughs> so that was uh, that was the determining factor. But I definitely think Sam made the right decision. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think so, too, because, uh, I mean, he probably didn't know how good he was going to be when he first started, and, and I'm pretty sure, you know, he had butterflies, you know, because every comedian, when they first started, they don't know. They, I mean, other people might say, hey, you're pretty funny, but in, in the comedian's mind, kind of like even how it was for Ronnie Dangerfield, he never thought he was that good because of the way he was brought up and stuff. So, he you know, Sam had to kind of make his own little impact, and, and eventually he, he would. Yeah. Well, I think probably the advantage he had over everyone was uh, uh, that he had preached for seven years. So, I mean, he wasn't intimidated by a crowd. 
And uh, Rodney Dangerfield actually seen him when he'd only been doing comedy for six weeks and was impressed. Uh-huh. But, you know, comedy to, to Sam, comedy, he was a natural. Uh, preaching, he had to really work at. But being funny, he was always funny. And he always had a gift of, of making anything uh, comical. And so when it came time that he got into comedy, which was down in Houston, Texas, uh, it was perfect for him because he, you know, he really never thought much about it until he got up on stage. So uh, as far as stage uh, fright or anything, he didn't have that. And the amazing thing was is that when he did comedy, he felt comfortable. So he had this great stage presence where I think in the ministry he just never, ever felt comfortable. And I suppose, you know, in the ministry, too, you, you kind of had to watch what you say. You know, you, you could be, like, too threatening. And I know some people probably thought, like, his comedy was kind of threatening because of the uncensored, you know, pretty much how uncensored it was. But even with uh, even with religion, you kind of got to make a point, more or less. But you don't want to... You don't want to piss too many people off when it comes to religion, especially the ones that, especially the people that are so serious about religion that, uh, you know, think that they're all the great because they follow God. Yeah. Well, the Christians, you know, per se, are very dogmatic. Uh, they're probably the biggest group of, uh, of unforgiving people, prejudicial people, uh, probably on the face of the earth. Uh-huh. And uh, so... You're up there, you're, you know, you, you have to watch how you say things, and you got to watch the content of what you're saying, because even Christians don't believe alike. Yeah. And so, you know, you had to, you know, and I'm sure Sam, you know, bad <coughs> that, because he had definite, like I did, he had definite uh, feelings and ideas about the Bible and about God and, and about Jesus, and, uh, you know, when you're in somebody's uh, church, you know, you really got to kind of figure out what they believe and kind of walk along those lines, or you're, you know, you're not going to be there very long. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I think, you know, I think he had that stress and that pressure where in comedy, you could let it all hang out. I remember uh, the first time that uh, uh, I saw him down in Houston, which was actually when Rodney was there, and, uh, you know, and he's up there dropping the F-bomb and, <laughs> and uh, you know, on the content of his comedy and stuff, and, and I remember he, afterwards he said, well, what do you think? I go, well, dude, you're, you're funny, but you don't have to use that kind of language. And I remember him telling me, and he reminded me of it many times later on, of, hey, brother, we're not in church now. <laughs> oh, we can boy. do what we want to do. Uh-huh. And so I think that freedom also was, uh, you know, that was Sam's thing. you got to remember, <clears throat> this is a guy that, that up until 25 years old, he never cussed, he never had a drink. I don't remember him ever having one drink till he's 25 years old and gotten into comedy. Wow. So, uh, you know, and all of a sudden now, man, he's got all this liberty. He wants to try it all. He wants the women. He, <laughs> you know, wants to try the drugs. He wants to drink. And uh, you put that with an uh, addictive personality like he had, and things fire out of control. And he had a good time. But I think that when he felt comfortable in that area. But I suppose, you know, that, you know, the reason why he was the way he was was basically because of how he was raised. And he probably, you know, back in the days, you know, even way back when. See, I was only born in 1983, so I'm only 29. But but you, you, if you're talking like in the 50s or 60s, you know, life was so... Everybody was uh, clean cut and raised almost similar to each other before the days of uh, things getting more uh, wilder and crazier. So... I can understand how he would want to experience some different things in his life that he never, whether it's right or wrong, just something that he never uh, probably thought ever existed. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with you. I mean, man, we were, not only were we Christians, we were Pentecostal, which, uh, you know, I used to watch my dad throw uh, people out of the church for wearing wedding rings or, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the women couldn't cut their hair and their dress had to be to the floor and down to their wrists and up to their neck. Which always amazed me because if they were breastfeeding, they pull their tit out right in front of everybody oh, and feed the baby. But uh, you know, you got to have that dress all the way down. Oh yeah, of but, course. I mean, we were we were raised very, very, uh, you know, very strict. And uh, so when Sam, I think, when he got out of the ministry, he got into comedy. Um, I think that was the freedom that you know he wanted to experience and did did experience and. And I, I didn't see anything wrong with it. I, you know, if that made him happy, then I was cool with it. So, what were your some of your favorite moments from listening to some of uh, Sam's uh, comedy? Like, what were some of your favorite uh, uh, jokes or, or routines or stories that he told? 
Well, well you, know you know, growing up in, in church, I loved this Jesus stuff. <laughs> Uh, you know, any of it, you know, talking about Jesus could never be married because, yeah. uh, you know, there wasn't a wife uh, in the world would buy that resurrection story. Takes off on a Friday night with 12 other guys. He shows up Monday, looks like he's been sleeping in a ditch. <laughs> and uh, everything. I, you know, I, I just loved it. I loved it, you know, when, you know, when he's up there, you know, when he said Jesus is on the cross and and everybody was sitting around going, you know, I wish you didn't have to die. And we're all crying. And everybody goes, oh, maybe I wouldn't have to if somebody get a pair of pliers and a ladder. <laughs> and, uh, you know, things like, I mean, I just had a church stuff. I, I didn't find it offensive. I didn't find it sacrilegious. And, uh, but, I mean, there there wasn't anything Sam did I didn't think was, was uh, wasn't funny. He just had this ability. I remember probably the, Oh, the, if, if there is a worse, probably the worst subject that he picked was is that we were getting ready to do a show in L.A., and I was his, I was his personal manager, and uh, Sam very seldom ever read the paper. If it wasn't on CNN, he didn't know about it. And uh, I came in, and we were hanging out in the back with some other guys, and, and Sam said, uh, well, what's going on, dude? And I told him, I said, you know, I read the sickest story in the paper today. It was on a Sunday I've ever read. And he goes, what is it? I said, there were there was a band of homosexual necrophiliacs <laughs> that were busted at Forest Lawn, actually the same funeral home Sam ended up going to, <laughs> but busted at Forest Lawn here in, in uh, Burbank uh, that were spending $3,000 a piece to spend an hour with the freshest male corpse. Oh, jeez. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not telling him for any... Uh, <laughs> routine or anything else I'm just telling because this I thought it was the sickest thing I ever oh sure oh, you know yeah. I ever heard of well Sam ends up doing a fantastic routine about it oh yeah I, re and, I remember uh, that I remember that seeing that on one of his uh, specials yeah yeah on, uh, actually on his first stage field special at the Roxy you know and he's there you know laying on the stage talking about you know this guy faced death decomposer disease and getting ready to go home to be with Jesus and he starts rocking back and forth you know rock <laughs> hey, hey, what the f what is this and uh, I mean if you can make that if you can make some guy screwing another guy in the ass after he's dead if you can make that funny you'd make anything funny uh, <laughs> yeah I, I, yeah no, it's all coming back to me I, I can remember that I can remember him saying that now <laughs> jeez Wow! And then that to the first the first joke that people remember remembered him for on the uh, on the HBO special with Rodney was uh, feeding the hungry. Okay. That he made made fun of uh, you know Sally Struthers and them that uh, you know yep. got little Hodgie in a mud hole and uh, you know won't you please help and you know and Sam goes hey you know you you know you got a film crew five feet away you give this kid a sandwich. Said you got you know you got a director there going don't feed him yet we need hunger we need hunger if you can make people laugh making fun of world hunger and that was one of the first jokes that everyone remembered that when he hit the scene is uh was that was one of the jokes they remembered was you live in a desert you know move to where the food is yeah 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 that uh, that kind of reminds me of that one guy or whatever that uh, does that commercial. Uh, with the, the feed the hungry or for help the children, he looks like Kenny Rogers or whatever. I think you know who I'm talking about. I don't know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know the name or whatever, but it's like, geez, you know. I mean, you figure uh, they do enough commercials, and the, that guy is always wearing a nice, nice outfit and everything, and then you see all these starving children. It's like uh, something's wrong here. <laughs> well, I always, I always thought, you know, when they had Sally Struthers, you know, uh, doing the uh, commercial, and yeah. she weighed like 300 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's talking about feeding the hungry, and you're like, well, Jesus Christ, why don't you push your plate back a few, you know, a little bit and give her some of yours? <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, you know, it was just, uh, but, I mean, that was the kind of stuff that, that uh, you know, I used to tell Sam all the time, man, I don't know how your brain works, <laughs> because he could he could think of funny stuff on a situation that you could give you or me a hundred years, we'd never think of anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this this would be off the top of his head. It would just be, you know, just automatic. It wasn't like something he would plan out. I mean, it'd be up on a show usually the first time he did it and the first time any of us heard of it and probably the first time he thought of it <laughs> is he's up on stage. Jeez. And, you know, and it just comes to him and he had this, 
this really genius ability to make anything funny. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely it definitely seemed like that. I mean, he he had so much charisma and and just uh, just like I said, w- wasn't afraid of anything really. Uh, but like, how how do you think the the media handled all these jokes and all these uh, stories that he would tell? I mean, did he never get in trouble for saying some of these things oh, he, at all? Oh yeah, he he was always he was always in trouble. To be honest with you, with TMZ and. Uh, the media and everything the way it is today, I don't think Sam ever would have made it. Oh wow! Uh, you know, if he would if he would have started today. Uh, well, if, you got to remember every. I mean, this is this is a guy. Probably the biggest controversy he called, and probably one of the or said, and, and one of the probably one of the few regrets he ever had was he was on David Letterman, and uh, they were talking about AIDS and that Sam lived with two sisters and and. Uh, you know, and Sam's up, you know, and he's sitting there on the couch going, yeah, man, I wish they find a cure for this disease. You know, I'm getting tired of, you know, having the same two sisters <coughs> here and, and all that. And, uh, you know, and so David, talking about AIDS, well, Sam goes, yeah. Yeah, you know, and he's talking about, you know, heterosexuals die of AIDS, too. Well, Sam, off the cuff, uh, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, heterosexual die of AIDS, too. So it's about like Vermont, the capital of Vermont. You don't know what it is, but you know it's there. So that's how... Is a heterosexual. You know, they say they die of them, but none, none of us ever know them. Uh, well, the problem was Ryan White had just died. This little boy. Yep. That Michael Jackson and Elton John and you know a bunch of celebrities had kind of rallied around, and he had just died of each. And uh, that was probably the biggest controversy. Uh, you know that Sam Sam faced with any of his routines because here he is on national TV going. You know, it's really it's really a homosexual disease, and only gays die of it. And here you got this little boy that died of it. Just yeah. that, that was national, and so uh, that was one he regretted. But even out of that, he made it funny. You know, and talking on his apology and his show to the gay gay community. You know, and that was hilarious. You know, talking about how his act makes him sick, and this is that. And I don't know how far your show can go, but I won't go too explicit. But oh, it's the internet. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Huh? It's, it's just the internet. Oh, it doesn't well, matter. You know, he said, you, know, uh, you know, he got up and he said he wanted to buy, apologize to the gay community, and naturally everybody's booing. You know, because they're his fans, and and they're no, 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 no. I want to apologize. You know, they said that. Uh, uh, you know, my uh, my act makes them sick. Of course, this comes like it licked out of each other's ass on a date, but I make them sick. Oh, yeah. I make them sick. And, uh, you know, they say I'm not sensitive. And, uh, you know, and, and of course, this comes from guys that take a, a foot of cock up their ass, but I'm, 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 you know, I'm not sensitive. I'm not sensitive. And, uh, you know, things like that. I mean, even his apology was was uh, hilarious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, honestly, Sam, you know, and that's why Sam later on explained when he was questioned by the media about it, and First, he regretted it. He had a best friend's dad that died of AIDS. And uh, he said it was just a flippant remark. But he said, on the other hand, if you think the public doesn't perceive this as a gay disease, you're out of your mind. Yeah. And he said, I was clearly reflecting what the public, you know, sees of this. Even, you know, he went back down. He never went down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you know, and, and that's just the thing too. You know, I you kind of wonder what life would be like now if, uh, you know, if he was still alive. And I've always kind of wondered this, and I'm pretty sure you wonder this. What do you think uh, he would think about the world today if he was still alive? Oh, I think he would be. I think he'd be <coughs> very frustrated with Barack Obama. Uh, first, I don't know that Sam would have been doing. Uh, much stand up if he was still alive. We had just signed a uh, a three movie deal, and we just also had just signed his own series on Fox uh, when he got killed. And I'm literally talking the week before he got killed. We signed those. And Sam's real goal was to uh, you know was to be in movies and be on on TV, and you stand up as a uh, you know a vehicle to get there. Sure. And uh, and you know. So I don't know, if first, if Sam would have been doing stand-up, but he still would have been expressing his viewpoints. But I'm sure still would have got him in trouble. But like, you look at all the stuff that's happened since he died. Rodney King, uh, you know, can't we all get along? Yeah. 
I mean, you know, Michael Jackson uh, over and over in, in messes and stuff. Uh, so I think Sam would have had a ball. Oh, yeah. I think mean, he'd have had a ball doing it. Yeah, and, and, you know, and the thing is, too, is, you know, I heard rumors, and I don't know if, you know, were some of the movie deals that he was doing, or that was gonna that he was going to do uh, with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Rick Moranis? Was that a rumor, yeah, or was yeah, that actually, true? Yeah, actually, one movie was with Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> where uh, Sam played a a convict, and the movie was uh, an adopt-a-convict kind of a premise where they have a local prison, and they uh, bring, uh, you know, they take a convict home to live with them, and it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, Beverly D'Angelo, Christina Applegate, and uh, Corey Feldman. And Sam is the is a convict that they, uh, you know, take in, supposedly adopt. Well, by the end of the movie... Uh, the kids are in juvenile. Our Schwarzenegger and D'Angelo are in prison. Sam's living in their house. Okay. And so uh, that was one. Another, I don't know what the premise was for Rick Moranis, but uh, then then the third was an in-concert movie. Okay. Just, <laughs> just words, more. A con- you know, a movie uh, in the background and, and doing a concert with Sam. Oh, okay, okay. Almost yeah. like... Uh, almost oh, yeah, like that, uh, that wasn't rumors. That was all true. Okay, so that was almost like, would be like uh, the Eddie Murphy, Raw, and Delirious type yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would have been kind of interesting yeah. to see. I mean... I mean, you know, it's it's so sad that uh, that we never got to see any of that stuff because I, you know, I've always been like I said a, a fan of Sam and and I've seen just about everything that he's done as far as films, uh, like just the movie Back to School, the legendary, uh, the legendary teacher that he you know that he played uh, that screamed to Ronnie Dangerfield and uh, uh, the uh, thing that he did with uh, Al Bundy, you know, being the uh, yeah. wonderful Christmas special, all the stuff that we've talked about and heard before, but it just, uh, I mean, you're the only one that kind of, you know, you, you got to know him really good because you're, you know, you guys are brothers. What in, what got you in, into being his uh, road manager or just being his manager alone? Well, he had asked me, uh, he had asked me many times to come out and manage him. Well, the problem was he was making 35 bucks a night at the uh, comedy store. Actually, when he first came out, uh, Mitchie didn't play anybody, and then all the comedians, <laughs> all the comedians went on strike, and so uh, she ended up paying him 35 bucks a night if it was Richard Pryor, Sam Kennison, or whatever. And uh, so there really wasn't much to manage. I would come out when there were supposedly deals which never, ever panned out. Uh, I was pastoring a large church in Illinois, and one Sunday morning I got up, and it was time for me to do something else. I just knew, you know, I just felt it in my heart. I need to get out of the ministry and do something else. So I thought, well, you know, I'll go out and and manage Sam. I had enough money, my wife and I and my baby had enough money to uh, take care of us for a couple of years out here. And, uh, you know, put all the effort in and see if we could get it to crack. Well, uh, really with no, you know, none of my abilities or whatever, it just happened that... Uh, Rodney Dangerfield was doing an HBO special, which he had to make us do. Uh-huh. We thought it was a, uh, we thought it was a, a, a comedy uh, contest. Uh-huh. And you know, and Sam wasn't going to win with his material. He wasn't going to win a contest. <laughs> and I remember uh, first uh, Rodney was at the uh, store, and he'd been he'd known Sam for about six years. And so he told uh, he told Sam said, uh, "Hey, I, I got this young comedian special that." You know, I want you to do I think it'd be good for you. Well, Sam thought it was a contest, so he told Rodney, so I don't do contests. And so uh, Rodney asked around the comedy store, because I'd met him, and, and he goes, where's his brother at? And they said, well, I think he's at home. And so Rodney called me, I don't know, it must have been 2 o'clock in the morning, and said, hey, I, uh, I'm doing this young comedian special on HBO, and I think it would really help Sam if he does it. Well, you know, I... I thought the same way Sam did, and I went, well, Rodney, he doesn't do contests. Now, never forget Rodney going, what the fuck is it with you guys? It's not a goddamn contest. <laughs> it's a showcase. It could help him. Well, we go up to New York thinking that we're getting a free trip, and, you know, Sam would do six minutes on this HBO special, but, you know, we really didn't think anything was going to come of it. And uh, the first night when they did the run through at Dangerfields, uh... Sam actually cleared the room. Everybody, all the customers walked out. And they came off the stage, and Rodney told Rodney, he said, man, I can't get going in six minutes. 
And Ronnie said, oh, tomorrow night you're going to be great, man. You, you'll kill tomorrow night. I'm telling you, you're going to be great. <laughs> and so the next night came when they did film it, and the rest of it was history. That six minutes um, changed Sam's life. Wow. Yeah. That was the big break. From then on, we had everybody coming and courting us, and rather than us trying to get people to, you know, to sign him on and stuff. And so, uh, so I really can't take, even though I was his manager, I can't take much credit for it. It was uh, Rodney that persisted, and uh, and if he hadn't, I don't know that Sam ever would have made it. I don't think he would have. So, uh, so uh, when when you found out that he passed away after uh, getting killed in the uh, accident, like, what was your first reaction? Like, how did, it, how did it make you feel after finding out that this actually happened? Well, actually, I was with him. Okay. I was uh, in the uh, vehicle behind him when he got hit, and uh, uh, we really didn't know that uh, Sam was dying. We knew he was hurt. Uh, you know, a lot of the reports... Uh, you know, were inaccurate. He didn't get out and walk around or anything. Uh, he was hit head on. He was in a uh, in his fiberglass Trans Am Special Edition Trans Am, and he hit head on. You know, on a turn and a half truck. And uh, but you know, physically he didn't. You know, he didn't. There wasn't like a lot of injuries that we could see. Uh-huh. And when I had opened the door, he was sitting in his seat, and uh, and he just he looked at me and kept saying, oh, "Why?" Why now? Why? And I was telling him, you know, because we were in an area, we were going to Laughlin, Nevada for a weekend of shows, but we was in an area we had no phone service. Yeah. And so I was telling him, you know, man, just, you know, just stay still. We got help on the way, and, uh, you know, don't, don't move around. Well, he weighed 280 pounds, and he kept scooting over to get out of the car, and, you know, and I realized we're not going to be able to keep him in the car, so I told you know, the guys that were with me, let's just lay him right here. And so as he came out the door, uh, you know, we kind of caught him or carried him and laid him right right there in between the door and the body of the car. And uh, I got his phone thinking, well, maybe I can get service on his. I couldn't get any on mine. And while I was trying to get service, uh, I don't know why, you know, how sometimes you just say something you don't think, you just say it. And yeah. Now I'm trying to get service on this phone, and all of a sudden, before I even thought, I went, as he quit breathing. Oh, wow. And uh, someone checked and said, oh, God, you know, and they started freaking out. You know, oh, God, you know, he's quit breathing, he's quit breathing. So I said, all right, well, everybody calm down. So does anybody know CPR besides me? <coughs> well, the kid that hit him actually volunteers at a hospital. And so uh, he said, I do. I said, well, get your ass over here. And uh, so he started doing chest compressions. And, uh, but he was gone. But just before he went, when I was trying to get service, uh, I was standing there and, and he started, he was looking at somebody, but his eyes weren't rolled back, they weren't set. Uh, it's like I said, we didn't know that he was dying. I mean, yeah. for anybody that was there to, you know, say they knew that they're lying, we didn't. And, uh, but he was looking at something or somebody and he kept going, or he started with, um, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then, um, then he went, okay, 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 and that was it. Huh. And he was gone. And you seem to be kind of relaxed uh, when when that happened. I, I would have figured it would have really shook you. I mean, I'm sure it did shake you up a, a, a lot, you know, even before and even after. But it but it seemed like you you seem to be a lot more calmer when it came to getting for help and stuff, more or less. Well, you know, the way everything happened, it was almost like it was supposed to happen. Uh, he wasn't in pain. Um, like I said, I was right there. He was, he, he was never in pain. And I think, you know, and even Sam, you know, I think all of us knew that knew Sam very, very well. We didn't. We knew he wasn't going to be an old man. <laughs> you know, we, his lifestyle and stuff, he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to see old age. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know, and, and I doubt that he knew that, you know, he was going to go like that. But there was actions uh, for the last few weeks and few months of his of his life that that made me, uh, you know, they indicated to, to me that he thought something was going to happen to him. Uh-huh. And uh, so when this, you know, eventually happened, and and uh, uh, I'm sure I was in a, a bit of, of shock, 
but you know my personality is you know you you, you got to take care of business yeah and uh, and so on that I just put myself in a business mode at that time and uh, you know what what do we need to do here and uh, then by the I you know show you how kind in your heart changes things is that you know I get to the uh, get to the hospital and when we get there the uh, coroner and the head of the hospital was there uh, waiting for me and when I come in they said you know you need to uh, you know sign some papers and stuff and I remember telling them uh, I'm not signing anything until you know I, I know how my brother is yeah. well I knew I knew he was dead he died out on the highway with us yeah. but you know somewhere between my heart and my head it just wasn't connecting and uh, you know so then they said well you know he expired and um, I remember my reaction was, well, well, I know that, but, well, you know, what happened to him? But, you know, I, so I'm sure I was in, you know, in a state of shock because, uh, you know, the, it's hard to reasonably deal with something like that. Yeah. I, but I, think that's the, I think that's the cushion that, you know, God gives gives us all so that we can deal with tragedies and things like that because if it, we just dealt with the stark reality with moments like that. We'd probably be <coughs> dead ourselves. We'd probably die ourselves. Yeah, that I, I would agree with that. Well, you know, and, and that's interesting to know because you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you hear all types of rumors and stuff, and even from people who say that they were there but they weren't really there, just because oh, you know yeah. everybody believes you know what they're told, and and it's like. Uh, Imagine if he would have died, you know, in today's world, you know, like 20 years later, and, oh, I can only imagine what the, the media would have been like. It would have been on <laughs> CNN and TMZ and all the new, all these uh, fake websites, and, oh, man, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not, count, not counting all the iPhones. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, so iPhones. What, what's funny is, is that I, I promise you I've run into at least a 1,000 people, at least down through the years that, that have told me I was there, man. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I was there at the highway when he died. Well, if that was true, <laughs> we had one gigantic crowd. Oh, yeah. So, but, I, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, you know, somebody hits a historic home run and all of a sudden there's uh, 100,000 people was there. Uh-huh. So, anyway, I don't I don't really put much, much stock in that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things. A lot of things that a lot of people didn't know was is that Sam actually planned on going back in the ministry in May. He died in April, and he was really planning on going back in the ministry the very next month. Oh wow! And uh, you know, and doing movies and TV, but uh, getting off the road as far as stand up and and going back and uh, you know having speaking engagements in the uh, ministry. Huh. So you know, the last year and a half, uh, uh, he had cleaned up. And Sam actually, he considered himself a believer, uh, you know, ever since he was in the ministry. When he got in comedy, even with the kind of comedy he did and everything, he still considered himself a believer. Uh-huh. Well, that's cool. And, uh, and I'm not one to judge, you know. I think I think probably he, um, you know, if there is a heaven and a hell, I, I think he probably is in heaven. Yeah. You know, and that, that's just the thing. I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure he was a pretty... I mean, uh, you know, it's like it's like when you uh, get on stage at, or even when you're an actor or something like that, you have to put on, like, a, you have to make a character for yourself. A lot of people don't realize what the type of person you are off stage or off camera. They only know the person, you know, what they see. And then they probably think, well, what's up with that person? Why is that person being that way or whatever? Well, it's part of their character. And Sam... You know, may not have seemed like he was a Jesus believer while he was on stage, but, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, that he was a, a very sensitive guy off camera, very loving, very caring, not an asshole, you know, more or less, like he would probably uh, be like on stage. Only you would know that, being his brother. Well, actually, actually anyone that was around him uh, off stage uh, only, only had compliments. Yeah. It was a... Uh, he was a fantastic uh, person. He was a giving person, even to a fault. Um, and, uh, you know, very caring person. He wasn't as loud, uh, you know, in person as he was on stage. Uh, but very compassionate. I'll tell you these last... I'll tell you a story here, and then we'll have to get off here in just a few minutes. Sure, sure. But one of the, uh, one of the great stories I had is that uh, Sam was uh, going to do the Johnny Carson show. 
The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And uh, uh, when he lived in, in Burbank, there at Glenda, or uh, lived in Burbank, he and my brother and and different ones would walk down to the studios. Well, you had to go down about 2 o'clock in the morning to get a ticket to uh, to be in line for like 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning to get another ticket. And uh, then, you know, you come back at like 3 in the afternoon, you get in another line to be able to get in the studio. Well, <clears throat> Sam calls me and he says, hey, uh, get, you know, get one of those uh, food trucks and uh, have them down there at two o'clock for these people to come and uh, give them give them their breakfast. I'll pay for it, whatever they want. Let them have breakfast, and so I did. Then I, you know, I had them come back at seven or eight, and they got breakfast again. Well, now we go to do the show, and they're lined up outside the studio to go in, and Sam has the limo uh, stop, and he went through and shook every single person's hand and talked to them that were getting ready to come in and see him. Uh, in the Tonight Show. Oh wow! And I think that is a, uh, I think that's a perfect uh, illustration of, of who Sam was. He never forgot where he came from, and as he went down that line, shaking each one of their hands, he would tell them, "I used to stand right here. <laughs> I used to be right here in this line to watch this show." Wow! And the funny thing is, if you ever see the the first time Sam was on uh, the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson comes out and does his monologue, and then he starts announcing what guests he has that night. Uh, he has no idea what Sam has done, and Sam didn't do it for publicity. He just wanted, you know, he wanted the people to know sure. that they have a dream. And, uh, but as he gets to Sam, he goes, and, uh, you know, tonight we've got the comedian Sam Kennison. And, uh, man, the place just uh, erupts. <laughs> because, you know, Sam shook all their hands. He's fed them. He's done everything else, and uh, I remember Johnny Carson you know, on TV going, well, well, I guess you know who he is. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, but that, that was, you know, that was typical Sam. That wasn't unusual. That was him. I never seen him ever treat a fan badly. I never seen him, uh, you know, when people wanted autographs and would line up, he'd stay there no matter how long and sign autographs and, and everything else. And, you know, the media kind of painted a different different picture of him, but I think Sam even kind of uh, relished having that image of being a an outlaw and and everything else, which he was to a certain extent. But the real the real Sam Kennison uh, was the one I just told you about at the Johnny Carson show. Wow. That was Sam and all of his friends, celebrity and non celebrities, uh, they felt the same way. Well I appreciate uh, you just uh, being a guest on my show and uh you know, this this is very very inspir or very inspiro or inspirational more or less. And uh, uh, once again, just honored to, to the fact that you'd be nice enough to, to come on and share your words through Sam's life. And uh, uh, I I don't know how to thank you. I mean, it's really an honor. Well, you don't have to thank me. I uh, we do have a movie coming out uh, on Sam. Actually, have two. Uh, one is uh, with HBO is producing it, and the other is uh, Crucial Films. And uh, I think the people are going to enjoy it because you have a generation now. He'll be dead 21 years, but now you have a generation that doesn't even know who he is. Yeah, that will once again be exposed to to his style, his uh, his comedy, and I think uh, I think there'll be uh, you know even a, a bigger fan base than he already has, which has almost been like a cult. I mean he. He still has millions of people that, uh, you know, that still, I mean, we sell, we sell uh, CDs and DVDs on his website, and believe me, we, we have orders every day. Oh, every I believe day. it. So, I believe it. So they, uh, huh? I, I believe it. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, anyhow, so that we got, he's still alive as far as we're concerned, and to <laughs> me it's just like he, just like he's always, you know, he's never died because I deal with him every day. And uh, so it's been a privilege and a pleasure to be on your show, and I'll be glad to come back anytime you like me to. All right, man. Well, thanks again, and uh, you have a good rest of the week, and uh, take care, my friend. All right, you got it, brother. All right, bye. And that was the late, great Sam Kinnison's older brother, Bill Kinnison, and... Uh, Man, I tell you, what a what an honor to uh, uh, chat with him, uh, just to learn more or less, just to learn about the the life of uh, his brother Sam Kinison, uh, s some stories that you probably did know, 
that we talked about uh, and some stuff that you probably didn't know and some I didn't know. And that's why I like uh, doing some of these tribute interviews as well as just talking to current guests or whatever. But to, to do these tribute interviews because you're always learning uh, d- different information and different facts and stuff. And, and we're going to air this on Wednesday because of it being the 21st anniversary of uh, the death of uh, Sam Kinison. It, he died April 10th, 1992, and this Wednesday is April 10th, so there won't be no video at all, and I, and I do apologize once again for some of these videos not being like how I want them to be, uh, basically because I was getting over a cold, I still kind of have it, uh, a little bit of it left, but uh, uh, trying to try to get better anyway, because we got some uh, exciting things coming up pretty soon. But once again, just uh, thank you to Bill Kinnison and uh, his family, the Kinnison family, and uh, check out the website samkinnison.org. And I'm going to put it, uh, I'm going to put it uh, down below so people can check it out and buy some merchandise and, and keep Sam's mem- uh, memory alive. Anyway, I'm Frankie Slauson, and uh, thanks again for tuning in for this special interview, and uh, we'll see you again for another great Frank Slash Show interview series, uh, interview, and uh, the daily vlogs. So, bye-bye.